Hello, Culture Matters Podcast. Before I introduce you to our guest, here's a quote I picked just for this episode. Be not simply good. Be good for something. Henry David Thoreau. I, I had to pick that quote. About to introduce a good friend of mine, Andre Watson, Keller Williams commercial. I believe not only an expert in this space, but a tenured expert, uh, going on 16 years, if I'm correct, as an advisor, really consultant to business owners, investors, uh, individuals in the commercial space, analyzing leases, understanding the market, uh, coaching, uh, coercing. No, I mean, that's not the right word. Uh, having fun. <laughs> Andre's a good friend and somebody that I've always looked up to. So thanks for coming on the show. Jay, hey, man, it's good to see you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a while since we've been able to, to catch up, but I like whenever we're able to. It's always fun. Yeah, it's been too long. I, I guess the, the question that's not only on my mind, but I think a lot of people that may be lay person to the commercial space is what the heck is going on? And is <laughs> it what people that maybe don't know what they're talking about are saying? You right. know, it's like the first thing is like, all right, are you all right? Uh, is it, <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. On? Do we need to be worried about the world? <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, let me say this. Um, we don't, although the company is the commercial real estate arm of Keller Williams Realty International, uh, the company is called KW Commercial, which is a separate entity all by itself. And um, there are 2,300 plus uh, commercial brokers nationwide with KW Commercial, which wow. as far as headcount is probably the largest commercial real estate brokerage, uh, not only in, in the country, but probably in the West in general. You wow. Know? So yeah, we've, we've come a long way in a short amount of time. Um, so you know that, that, that's a great question, Jay. What is going on, <laughs> right? I mean, I, I don't even know where to start. There's so much, right? Um, so you're familiar with the economist Milton Friedman? Yes, sir. Um, brilliant man. And another economist I really like is Thomas Sowell. Oh, amazing. Yeah, these men are absolutely brilliant. And I figured if I were that smart, I'd be a billionaire sitting on a beach right now. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, you know, one of the things that they always seem to come back to is that government causes more problems than it fixes. And uh, in a free market, government is to be a referee. There are rules in place, and then you have someone who makes sure that the rules are followed, and that would be a governmental body or officials, right? Once a governmental body or government officials begin to micromanage or attempt to micromanage an economy, it's, it's, a, it's a very slow spiral downward, you know? And no one really knows where it's gonna end up. And one of the things that I've realized over the years, as a matter of fact, um, about a month and a half ago, there was a, we had a small conference in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, with KW commercial brokers from different parts of the country. And our guest economist is a gentleman named, uh, Casey Conway, uh, Red Shoe Economics. I think the name of his, uh, uh, company is right. And I asked him, I, I'm like, listen, me as being a layman when it comes to an economist, from where I'm sitting, this looks like there's a deliberate attempt to compromise the economy, right? And I said, I asked him, it can't be that the people who are doing this are st stupid and don't know what they're doing. So my other logical uh, conclusion is, is that it's by design, right? He's like, well, they are that dumb, okay? Mm. And he said a part of the problem is that many of the people that work in government are people from academia, right? Who've never really been in the real world. And as a result, as a result of that, 
don't really understand the way that the free market works, right? So with that said, there are a number of variables that are at play, which are gonna adversely affect the commercial real estate market, right? I mean, obviously the, the most obvious one right now that's affecting us in an adverse way is the hike in interest rates, right? Some say it's good that interest rates would go up, it slows everything down. Others say it's bad, you know, I frankly, for, for, for someone in my position, Jay, it doesn't really matter, right? Because I have no control over that, right? The only thing I can do is adjust my business to a shift in market, right? Mm. To make sure that I stay afloat and that the people I do business with are informed and have information in front of them that will help them make a decision concerning their asset you know, number one is to what the asset is worth, okay? Um, number two, is it a good time to sell? Is it a good time to buy, okay? Three, what are the variables or what are the risks involved in them transacting in a hostile or shaky market? You know, um, our business is going to expand, right? Well, I mean, right now the answer is no for the most part. I guess it depends what type of business. Right. So, you know, when when one says what's going on or when he asks that question, well, what's going on? The answer, the real answer is nobody really knows. You know, thank you for coming on the podcast and telling the truth. <laughs> About time. <laughs> nobody really knows. And like it, it's almost it's almost like being a meteorologist. <laughs> right. It's like a 50 50 shot. You know? Would you say that that adds to the importance of having an educated professional helping guide someone buy or sell right now? I, I would say that is 100% true because here's the thing there are different tiers of owners and investors, mm -hmm. right? You have the institutional people or institutional entities, right? And apparently, wherever these institutions have their offices, there must be a money tree because they seem to have an unlimited supply of money all the time, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know where they get their money from, but they always have money, wow. right? You know, and then you have more like uh, of, of the regional type of owner and investor, right? Not institution, but you know they do well for themselves, right? You know they they might only be like say in like the Southwest region or the Central region or or the Mid Atlantic region or Southeast, right? Where they 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 stay in those areas, they know those areas, right? And they don't really expand too far from that, mm -hmm. you know. Then you have like the mom and pop type of investors, right? Who might be like, okay, you know what? I I'm willing to do a deal within an hour drive of my house, okay? Or I'm building, you know, if I'm a builder, if, I, if I'm a home builder or I build office buildings or apartment buildings, you know, I'll do things within an hour radius or within like a, a 90 mile radius of where I am, you know? And then, and then you have your local people, you know, who are like, they, they have, you know, a, a career or like a regular job where they go to, but they also invest in real estate on the side, right? Just as a way to supplement their income or build a little something for the family nest egg, you know? So those, those are the generally the type of people who you have and who you're dealing with. You know? Is this an opportunity for that? Because I'm thinking, you know, the, the listeners that have interest in long-term wealth building that may be uncertain of 2023, 2024, 2025, where, where does that fourth category, that local person with the career, with the job that wants to invest on the side or that mom and pop one hour drive, is this the opportunity for those types or is this the, not an opportunity? Uh, and, uh, or are they like, what, what variables would you say make it an opportunity versus making it not an opportunity? 
Yeah, great question. You know, I would say that it's never a bad time to buy real estate, right? And um, I think it was either Warren Buffett or John Rockefeller who originally said it, but it's such a common saying with people in the business is that I don't buy until there's blood in the streets, mm. right? Well, blood started flowing in the streets in the summer of 2020, right? Wow. And um, I would say that, so here, here's the thing, Jay. There are some people who I talk to who are not making the move because they're afraid of interest rates, right? Now, you and I are probably too young to remember this. I certainly re remember him, but, you know, wasn't big enough to even know what was going on at the time. But when President Jimmy Carter was in office, interest rates were like 20, 22%, right? Wow. And, you know, people tell me, you know, who are older, it was like, yeah, you know, I, I remember when I got a loan at like 16%, I thought it was the greatest thing in the world, right? Listen, if you charge 20% now on a mortgage, I'm pretty sure that's called racketeering, mm. <laughs> right? <laughs> or Absolutely. loan charging, whatever, whatever you want to call it, right? So um, uh, I would say that um, it's never a bad time to buy something, I think you just have to be very careful and very diligent as to what asset that you're buying, right? And, you know, equally as important is the survivability of that asset during, during like a, a, a shift in mm -hmm. the market, right? Um, uh, uh, you know, um, for example, I'll give you a perfect example. Office right now is going through a huge change. Really? Um, would it be wise to go out and buy an office building, like a 20-story a office building? I would say on the surface, probably not, but there are the variables. You know, what is your long-term goal uh, for that asset, right? Are you looking, first of all, are you an owner-occupant? Okay, are you buying it for your business? Where let's say if it's a 200,000 square foot building, right? Are you gonna occupy 20% of it yourself with your company? And then, you know, you lease out the rest where it's all gravy, right? Uh, um, you know, uh, office is, is going through a shift. Um, there are, again, because of COVID, uh, you know, there's a lot more people working from home. Um, there are, uh, uh, tenants who would occupy a very large square foot square footage footprint in a um, uh, in a class A office building in the central part of a city, right? Who might now give up 25, 30 percent, maybe 35 percent of that footprint, and maybe what they'll do is open smaller offices uh, in the metro in the counties of that city in the surrounding mm -hmm. counties, right? And you know maybe some of their employees don't have to travel as far, right? Um, uh, maybe it's cheaper for them in the long run. You know, there's, there's so many variables, Jay. Anyway, I would say that number one, it's never a bad time to buy real estate. Number two, you know, is the asset that you're purchasing, does it have staying power? Or can it endure a shift in a market, right? And I think you have to be very diligent right? And kind of know what it is that you're doing and um, be able to, you, you have to um, uh, plan or make provisions for a downturn in the market so that you're not underwater. Do you, you mentioned the business that acquires a commercial property and maybe they, they're, they're occupying it and then they, um, the remaining space might be rented out. Is that something that you've seen uh, be a strategy that many businesses follow? No, it's not. And I'll tell you why. And that's, that's a great question. Managing a office building is not a task for the faint of heart, right? And if you are a business, and listen, there are businesses there are companies that own the buildings that they're in, right? 
and then they end up leasing out some space to a third party, right? But it's not the norm, okay? Not unusual, and I guess it depends on where you are too, right? But you know, it's generally not 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 the norm because a, a huge part of ownership of that asset is management, mm. right? And if you're running a company, you obviously have to hire a third party manager. Either way, I would imagine, right? But listen, if if you're you know, if you're like you know um, JD's Cog and Company, if you're if you're making cogs, right? You don't have time to be managing a building. That's not what you do. You're, you're in the business of making cogs, right? So it, 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 it makes better sense for them, right? To lease out a large space, right? And, you know, that landlord, that owner is an expert in owning and managing of such an asset, right? Which, you know, again, there are variables involved in everything, but that's mm -hmm. usually a better way to do it. I'm working on a deal right now on a 43,000 square foot medical office building that, that I'm selling. And uh, I, I have three offers on the table for it, right? And one of those offers is from an entity that wants, that is going to have their headquarters in that building, right? And for them, it actually is ideal because yeah. it's in an area where they want, right? The rest of the building is medical, right? And they are in the business of, of they're, they're also in the, in the healthcare space, right? So it, it might be a good fit, you know? But I would say that that is not normally, that is not the norm in most cases. And it, it, and it, the contention there is that it's going to take more management than the infomercial. Hey, yes, it is. Okay. Can we unpack that a bit? Like the business of real estate, uh, what, you know, transformers, what more than meets the eye, kind of like, <laughs> what is what we, <laughs> what is, what are some of the things that we take for granted in, in this? It's almost like this, there's like a real estate culture feels like i mean maybe right. it's just me my bias been so around it so many my whole life it feels like near it at least close enough to think you know right wow. but like what is it really come down to the brass tax of it management uh what what else like what what is the business of real estate in your mind having served so many you know titans in that <laughs> titans right so you know um a lot of the people I know in this business do it because they love it so much, mm. right? And that, you know, um, it's it's interesting. You know, you you meet like one of the things I love about this business is that you meet so many people from so many different walks of life. You know, um, uh, there is I, I like the fact also, Jay. Like one of the big things in our culture now is diversity, inclusion, and equity or some nonsense like that, right? I, I think that if you want real diversity, first of all, you can't force it, mm. right? I think freedom, right? When people have freedom to transact and do as they will, obviously within the bounds of the law, again, the government needs to be there as a referee to make sure that the rules are enforced, right? But um, freedom brings... Um, uh, a whole slew of other enlightenments. It, 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 freedom opens a number of avenues to enlightenment, right? And one of the great things about this business is that not only talking about getting a license, being, be, being a licensed professional, right? But anybody can muster up um, a few dollars, you know, and, and put a deal together right, and get themselves wow. as a piece, whether it's a piece of equity or as, as the principal, you know, in, in, a, in a deal, there is no stopping anybody from doing it, right? I would say to you that, you know, the culture of real estate itself is, it, it's one of the things I've realized is that, like, just driving through areas that I never gave a second thought about, every storefront, every strip mall, every structure, right? 
is owned by somebody. It was put there for a reason. Whether or not it still serves that purpose is a totally different ballgame, right? But it's owned by somebody. It was put there for a reason, right? And there's a reason why it's abandoned and no longer functioning, you know? Wow. And within the, 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 the culture itself is, well, <laughs> this is going to sound funny, but we know one of the reasons that I find that, you know, a lot of people, I shouldn't say a lot, I found it that they're one of the reasons that people transact, right? Is that it's a way to put a layer between you and paying too much taxes, mm. right? Hold and, to build the wealth in that way to- Well, right. So, you know, you can, you can write off uh, or claim depreciation on an asset for, I think, for almost 30 years, dependent, right? Again, wow. there's variables involved, right? Um, I know a gentleman in the, in the business. Uh, he and I were talking one day. I called him about a, um, a single tenant net lease uh, who, by what we call a, uh, it's, it's, it's a national tenant um, who just renewed their lease for like another five years. They've been at this place for a good 15, 20 years already, wow. right? They're doing good business. I asked him if he would have any interest in it. So, you know, we're talking, right? This man said to me, because what he does is a thing called a 1031 exchange, right? And what that is basically is that when you sell a real estate asset, you are uh, obliged to pay capital gains tax on that asset, right? However, if you do an exchange, if you sell that and then you roll those dollars into a similar, um, not a similar, but like a, 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 a similar as far as price, right? Asset, right. right? You can defer those taxes out, you know, for however long that you own that, right? Wow. This man said to me, I've not paid taxes since 1992. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow. He's well, been working. Let me let me rephrase that. He hasn't paid capital gains tax since 1992. <laughs> yeah, we should rephrase it so we don't get a revolution. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Yeah, he said, I haven't paid capital gains tax since 1992, right? And, you know, that's some people's motivation for being in this business, you know? Now, when he and his wife pass, if he passes these things to, the, to his children, right, you know, I'm sure there's some way for the government to recoup a lot of that cost, mm. uh, to recoup those taxes, right? But, you know, that's generally a good reason why people get into this business. That's a part of the culture, you know? And also, Jay, I've realized in my time in this business, the best way to create wealth for you and your family is to own dirt. Really? Dirt has value, or you know, where we call it real estate, <laughs> right? But you know, have something, have ownership, control over something. Ownership, dirt is probably the most tangible asset there is. You know, like you can you can melt gold. You know, you can take gold and melt it down and do this, that, and the next thing. You know, don't get me wrong, gold is a great asset. Silver, like anything that's tangible, is good, yeah. right? But owning real estate, you know, very rarely is a bad thing, unless, of course, you know, you're over leveraged. Can you, you know? expand on that leverage piece? Uh, how could one avoid that over, you know, and you know, the emphasis on the over leverage, like, or the like what, how do you, what is leverage? So even maybe the late, someone that really doesn't know that term. Right. And so how do we approach that? So we don't lose what we, what we lose the dirt essentially. <laughs> right, right, right. So, you know, if you, if, if you, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of uh, very popular names in our culture right now that, that I could always use regarding leverage and what you have. And basically, you know, if, if you own something and uh, that asset has equity, um, let's say, you know, 
you, you, you have something that you've owned for a long time. It's now worth $1 million. Okay. And um, you need money, whether you want cash in your pocket or you want to take uh, some of those monies from that asset to go buy something else and kind of repeat what you just did. You simply go to the bank and you refinance, right? And whatever equity there is in that asset, the bank may be willing to give you up to 80% of that equity, right? Wow. So basically what you're taking is that you're, you're using that asset that, that you already have. And you're going to leverage it by pulling out its equity to go and buy something else and build your portfolio, add, add another asset to your portfolio, right? The way that we get over leveraged. So back in 2008, when the first meltdown happened, right? Um, when you started in the business, if I recall. That's exactly right. 2007, 2008 is when I started. In the midst brave, of meltdown. You're brave man. <laughs> hey, I had nothing else to do that day, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, what, oh well, gosh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, you know, uh, the way that you overextend or over leverage yourself, right, is if the bank is willing to lend you 70 or 80% of the value of it, but you go ahead and take, you insist on taking out 90% of it, right, then, you know, you may have um, <laughs> a, uh, an adjustable rate mortgage, interest only adjustable rate mortgage, right? Um, there's a shift in the market that you have no control over. Suddenly you were paying four and a half percent interest. Now you're paying 6.75 interest, right? So you can no longer afford your, your payments, whether it's interest and principles or just interest because the income coming in from that asset can no longer you can no longer uh, uh, make the required payments because the payments is more than the, than the revenue, right? So now you're upside down. Wow. Now, Wait, now so you're over leveraged. Listening, you're saying 4% is 6.75. See, it doesn't sound like a big jump. But it is when that's interest on 1 million or 2 million or $3 million. Wow. That's a lot of money. That starts to blow up. Well, yeah, 2.75% of a million is what, 27,500? Right? I think. Now, if you three if million, add, add, add 30% to that, right? And so on and so on and so on, right? You know, it, 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 it adds up, you know? And let's say that you are, that you own an office building and you were 98% occupied before COVID. Now you're 45% occupied. Wow. That's what's going on. I, That's what's going on. By the way, I didn't plan on us getting here. <laughs> <laughs> so I get the first question. <laughs> Holy cow. Right. So those, those are the type of things, Jay, that that are adversely impacting the market. Like that's, that's what we're seeing. You know, there, there are office buildings that are underwater, okay? And the banks are working with the owners, you know, because these people may have several different assets or they are able to divert funds, you know, their income from another asset to be able to keep another one afloat. How, how important are it, uh, our relationships in this, investment world and the reason i ask that is if if it really is if things are out of our control not everything but things big things like for example someone with a handful of office buildings uh whether the bank likes the person or not they're relying on that person to, to be able to you know get things done so how important are relationships and relationship fostering and building in the investment in real estate when the times are, are tough, um, whether that's buying time or right. trying to get creative? I'm, I'm curious, what, in your experience of being, because um, 
I would think if, if I had a terrible relationship with my bank, <laughs> like they didn't trust me. Right. My word or something. Right. Right. Uh, you know, maybe I just become a number on their balance sheet greater than somebody else or right. I'm curious what your thoughts on that. Yeah. So um, relationships are extremely important in so many ways. As a matter of fact, that's how most business gets done. I would say. Right. And um, if you have a good relationship with your lender, right, it's been my experience, they will do their best to bend over backwards in order to make it work for you, especially if you have more than one asset with that lender. Hmm. You know, if you've been doing business with them for years, you know, um, granted, again, there are some things that are so out of their control that they, they literally, at some point, there is a breaking point where they can't do anything. It's just the rules and the way that, 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 that the system is set up, right? But it's been my experience that um, uh, uh, a, a great relationship is never a bad thing. And you're likely, you're more likely to get through a tough time or downturn uh, if you have a good relationship with your lender. So my, 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 I guess I'm curious about your feedback on this hypothesis. If I'm going to invest into office buildings and I do it in a way where I have a prudent amount and then there's, there's a level of subjectivity with prudent of debt to equity and I have a really strong relationship with my lending partners, I'm going to be in a better position for when things get hard. I mean, I, 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 again, I, I would say that I'm, 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 I'm not going to say no to that, right? But at the same time, I can give you 100% yes, right? Because in order for the lender to fund that deal in the first place, no, there, there are so many variables that they would have to kind of get into the weeds mm. within the underwriting right regardless of who re regardless of the relationship right it has to pass the the underwriting smell test if you will right and you know um if it's if it's a little tougher than usual but you have a track record with that bank you know or wirehouse or whoever it is that you're using might be a little bit tough but hey you know what this guy has has done all these deals with us for years right he's he's always made it work Let's go ahead and approve that deal, right? And listen, if it bottoms out, we'll we'll deal with the fallout. I wanted to ask you this earlier. Have you like, is it? Are there people out there that they started young? They they just bought you know something every year or every few years, and they held on to it, and they just kept it going. And like forty years later. They're the person <laughs> like, yeah. is that a real thing? Or is that just in the movies? You know, is that no. even a possibility? Can I do that when I grow up or is someone <laughs> listening to this? You know what I'm saying? Is that That's great. really the American dream? Is it still alive? Um, I'm glad to say regardless, I don't know what once, you know, who you listen, who, uh, who your, your, your main uh, audience is for your podcast, right? Um, I make no bones about my thought my uh, about the way I feel about the political parties. You know, one of the interesting things that's that's always been said is that, oh, well, you don't talk about politics or religion, right? Well, to me, that's that's probably not a smart thing because those are the two things that, that it impacts our culture the most. Wow, powerful. And, I agree. And, yeah, so those, those are the things that need to be talked about the most, right? And, you know, I am not much of a liberal guy, right? Um, the, the world, there, there aren't large spaces of gray for me, right? Uh, my, my world is mostly very black and white. And I, I, I can only, I, I don't like when politicians tell me, don't believe what I'm seeing and hearing, mm. <laughs> right? <laughs> don't believe your lying eyes, right? And, you know, from the way it looks now is that, you know, there's one political party that seems to be undermining uh, everything that America has stood for, right? There's a gentleman that I know who owns um, a number of office buildings in Philadelphia, right? And, you know, he's obviously an older gentleman. He's been at, at this for a long time. Great guy, right? And myself and uh, one of my colleagues were talking to him one evening at an event. And he was telling us about when he bought his first duplex. Wow. Right? He, he, it was like in 1970 something, like early, like 
mid to late 1970s. Wow. Right. And he was talking about he thought he got a great interest rate at like some ridiculous rate, like 18 percent or something. Right. And he's like, yeah, I didn't really know what to do. But like, you know, he's like, I just thought this was really cool. Right. And um, the man now owns about five million square feet of office buildings, maybe even more than that, you know, in, 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 a, in a major market. Right. Wow. And he started really he started when he was in his early 20s. Right. And just kept at it, kept at it, and kept at it, and worked really hard, you know. And he rose to the top because of it, you know. And wow. now he has a, he has this empire that you know he goes in every day, but you know the kids run it now. He's got wow. probably employs a couple hundred people, right? And um, you know he he did it. There's a number of other people I know in the business who've done it. You know, I'm glad to say that regardless of what of what might come out of Washington, that uh, the American dream is still alive and well, who knows for how much longer, right? Um, but again, if we are allowed, if freedom is allowed to, to, to reign, right? It will create avenues for the average mm. person that no government program ever will. I saw that you, you've been a success for, for some time in this space, and I saw, uh, you had a great year last year. A lot of people didn't. W how important do you think your values have been in your ability to succeed in? And but and and I say like the commercial space is. Um, everyone says it's harder. <laughs> you know than I'm than, than <laughs> right? what you sorry. There's a little lag. What'd you say? But I said I'm I'm glad I'm glad that it's harder. Yeah, like that's the. <laughs> The, the view, um, it's kind of, at least to me, kind of behind a curtain in a sense a little bit. Right. I don't mean that in a negative context. Kind of like, oh, wow, you're commercial. Yeah, <laughs> like, whoa, yeah. That's how I, I you know, you know, so, so my question is, what, um, you know, yeah, how important have your values been in your ability to enter the space? and succeed at it. Right, great, listen, great question. Thanks for asking that, man. Um, I, I would say that, you know, um, um, putting Christian values into practice is not an easy thing, you know? Mm. Um, regardless of what might be thought of us as uh, believers in Christ, right? That it is not an easy thing. And I do my best to hold on to those values, you know, and, you know, it, it's, it's really a, a, a true, the, the true test is when you're, is when you're faced with, with, you know, with, 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 a, with a conflicting matter, you know, something that conflicts with you, with your values. And are you going to hold dear to them? Or are you going to like give a little bit? Because mm. once you give a little bit, it's a slippery slope. Right, and then it it becomes the, this gaping hole, right? Um, I would say that uh, my values, I like to think, are what sustains me. You know, that wow. um, having a wife uh, who fully understands the kind of business that you're in. Um, my wife is a successful corporate executive as well, right? So she gets being in the business world and what it takes. You know, um, and one of the things I can say too, one of the best things that, that I ever did was get a coach for myself. Really? Right? It, it was a game changer, you know? And um, wow. it, it's, it's, not, it's not that you don't know what to do. I think a lot of people know what to do, but to, to kind of um, organize that information, right? And be accountable to it, right? And sit down and talk about it and go, and go over it, it. It helps a lot. And um, uh, having a coach was something that was an absolute uh, game changer for me in so many ways. You see, do you, do you believe that the, 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 the role of mentorship plays a, plays a part in someone getting clear on their values or, or, or if they're well, living them or not? I, 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 think, I think you know what your values are. Like, you know, this is why it's so important to um, instill uh, 
um, you know, these objective type values in kids when, they, when they're very little, right? Because that's going to be the anchor for us in our lives. Mm. Right? When, when push comes to shove, you know, at least you are, you know, you're, you're, your value system has a foundation and it's not wishy-washy, you know, it's not, it, it doesn't change with, with, with the culture at hand. Because mm. again, you know, culture is so important, but there are, some cultures are wrong. You know, it's, it's simply wrong. I agree wrong. with that. Yeah, there is. I do agree with that. There is, if I you- I wouldn't want to live in North Korea. Thank you. That, that, that's a great example, Jay. That's a great example. And within our, within our American culture, there's a lot of subcultures. So when I was about 19, 20 years old, I went on tour with a Christian heavy metal band, right? One, wow. of, the, one of the coolest experiences that if anyone ever has a chance to go on a tour with a band, it, it, it's, it's, it's so great, right? And um, one of the things I realized then is that in this vast American culture, there are so many little different pockets of subcultures, right? But we all kind of have the same thing in common, whether you're black or white, yellow, red, it doesn't matter, right? And it's that those fundamental um, uh, objective truths, you know? Now, whether or not we follow them all the time is a whole different issue, but the fact of the matter is they are, they are there. And I'll give you an example of one of the, one of the things that I think are are a destructive part of our culture, right? Mm. And a lot of people are gonna disagree with me on this because they say, well, it, it's, it's adults, what's the big deal, right? But it's pornography, right? And pornography is something that tears apart marriages, right? Tears, a, you know, it, it causes divorce. It takes you down a dark hole because men especially get so, enveloped in that culture mm. it consumes them right and then one thing leads to another right next thing you know they're doing things going places yeah. uh, that that they normally would not why because they got caught up in that culture culture is so important it twists the mind it does it does it does it's very it it's it's very that's that's a great way to put it jay it twists the mind you know it gives a false sense of the way that it, it's it's a false um presentment it's a false presentation of something that is otherwise beautiful right that that, that was meant for one way but it's being perverted and twisted into something else so in what you said earlier about your values when you you, you you're, you're cognizant not to stray even a little in business because then before you know it you're down this whole rabbit hole. Someone that's listening to this that isn't sure of their business values, are they twisted? And maybe they don't even know it. I mean, that's my that's what comes to my mind. Right. Yeah, that's 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 a great question. I would say that even when you're cognizant cognizant of, of these things, you can still get twisted up, right? Because nobody's perfect, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And, and listen, as a younger man, you know, I've I've gone down many rabbit holes. I'm like, what am I doing? You know, let me get back out of here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's happened on more than one occasion, you know, which is, you know, one of the great things about getting older is that you can look back and be like, mm. man, I just, I just gave an inch and next thing I know, I'm like consumed and I didn't even realize I was being consumed, right? And listen, you know, someone can always argue, well, you know, I have a set of values that I adhere to and I get them from me. Okay, that's fine, but you know, without an objective base, they're simply opinions, and they're subject to change mm. depending on your experiences in life, right? Um, what I'm saying is that hold on to something that doesn't change with your experience in life. That you know, two plus two is four, regardless of what is going on outside here. You follow me? And for you, that's been oh yes, and so well because without that, then. You may change without re change your values without realizing you even changed them. That's exactly right. So it has to be an objective truth, you know, outside of you. No way out of it. There's there's no way out of it. It is what it is. And for you, that's that's what you believe is why you've 
had a successful career in life? Well, I think there is a couple of things. And I think that's, well, I, I never thought about it that way, Jay. That's a great, uh, that's, that's a good question. I never thought about it like, like that. I, I simply would say that it doesn't matter whether it's career or, or personal life or what have you, it's the same thing, right? Um, is that one of the reasons why I've been able to do well? Maybe it is. I would say to you that KW or I, Keller Williams Realty International, right, has, has created a, a, a model that works, right? And regardless of what your feelings are about anything else, if you follow that model, the end results are going to be the same. But then again, it's the, the statutes or the protocols of that model are objective, right? <laughs> like they're not changing, right? Mm, mm. Like here's what it is, right? You follow this, boom, 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 boom. Don't change it, right? Stick to it, right? And anyone I know within the company, whether they're with part of K, K, KW Commercial or Keller Williams themselves, uh, the, the, the residential company, anyone who sticks to that model have done fairly well for themselves. What are you most excited about in 2024? Um, it's a great question. Man, that's, that's like the hardest question you've asked me so far. <laughs> um, I, you know, listen, I, I would say that I am, I'm looking at trending upward, having my career trend, trend upward, God willing, right? I'm looking forward to be able to that that the market will will correct itself and that you know little mom and pop potential would be investors like maybe myself or even you jay if you wanted to start to add to your portfolio right it's time <laughs> said it's time would be you know a, this would be the time for people like us to mm. be able to really go in and sink our teeth into something into like a, a great asset that we otherwise would not have had the opportunity to unless there was a market correction. Wow, that's a, that's extremely exciting, actually. Well, you know, I try not to get too excited about anything, right? One day at a time, but, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to that potential. Like, do you see that the, the wealth of today that may or may not stay wealth, <laughs> Uh, we're born in times like this of the past. Yes. Yes. More people become financially successful during downturns in economies than when the market is right and high. Andre, thank you so much for coming on today. I, 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 uh, I feel a lot better after talking to you about this than I did before <laughs> I asked about it. Uh, I, I hope I can help come back. Hey, hey man. Uh, Jay, anytime, my friend, just call me, bro. I'm always here. And one last word for the audience. Like, what, what do you think they need to be taking away from this conversation? Well, listen, I, I would say that I would say this, right? Um, I, I I heard someone make the point that we spend a lot of time planning our lives, right? Um, you know. There are parents who like to schedule their kids for everything and put their kids on a schedule, you know, very regimented, you know. Um, when you're in high school, you plan for college. When you're in college, you plan for, you know, postgraduate and or for like your career when you get out of school. You know, you get a job, uh, you start planning for next to buy a house. You know, you do that plan, you know, find a wife or a husband or whatever, you get married, and then you plan for retirement, plan for tuition. So everyone's always planning. And the one thing that and this this was so great that I, I love that this you know I forgot where I heard it the first time but it's so true. Um, the one thing that we often don't plan for is for what happens when we leave this world. Mm. Okay? Um, uh, the great book from Stephen Covey, uh, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Right, um, one of those habits is that work with the end in mind. Okay, and. Um, I would say that if nothing else, we can plan all, all we want to, 
doesn't matter what happens in this world, we should always prepare ourselves for what happens after we leave this world and when we have to meet our maker. You know, so I would say regardless of how many pieces of real estate that you want to own, how much that you want to invest in, um, that's all fine and dandy. And I love it. And I think that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's incumbent upon us, especially as men, to work hard, you know? Um, uh, great quote in, in, in the Bible, uh, if, a man, it, if a man doesn't work, then he shouldn't eat, wow. <laughs> right? And um, uh, I, I believe in working hard, I love working. Um, can't imagine myself sitting around for too long and not working, but I would also say, if, if nothing else, we should also plan and prepare for what happens after we leave this world into the next. And you can leave your real estate to your offsprings. 